Hi, I'm Stephen Downs. Today I'm going to present the results of a uh, slideshow that I gave this morning at George Siemens' Connectivism Workshop at the Learning and Analytics Knowledge 28 or 2019 conference. Um, I did a talk this morning. The talk went well, but unfortunately I dropped the audio. Uh, so, well done, Steve. So, my plan here today is to recreate the audio, taking maybe a bit more time than I did this morning, um, but basically giving the same talk so that we do have some uh, recording of it, even if it's not the actual thing that was presented. Hopefully this one will be a bit better than the one this morning, but hey, you never know. The presentation followed uh, a talk by George outlining connectivism and of course the uh, intent of the workshop as a whole is to explore connectivism with respect to learning analytics. George outlined his perspective on what connectivism is, what connectivism is and where it comes from and my role, uh, what I decided to do is to follow that up by looking at some recent work in connectivism this is work that has been done uh, by other people around the world and presented in journals, etc. And what I wanted to do is catch myself up with this literature uh, and see how people were interpreting the main ideas and what I thought about that. So the first thing uh, that we look at is how connectivism is in fact being interpreted. And by and here like connectivism is a really complex theory it's got a lot of moving parts so what i was interested in is uh you know what things people thought were important and well the nature of knowledge is important the learning process network formation autonomy and decision making these are all the the things that came up in various uh papers uh the nature of knowledge as knowledge distributed across a network of connections and learning as the ability to create and traverse those networks. This is an idea that came out in a bunch of the papers that I saw. Uh, sometimes people would read into that. For example, uh, Marrero Guillemin uh, said that this implies that the links must precede the linked parts. The laws of interaction must precede their content, etc. And I don't see it that way, um, you know, connect, uh, you know, uh, node or edge, uh, entity and connection. There isn't so much a chicken and egg problem here. Uh, you know, you don't have a node without an edge. You don't have an edge without a node. Uh, so there's no part that's prior to any of the other. Another part of the interpretations that I saw was the idea of knowledge emerging from the network. So if we, we say that connectivism is knowledge distributed across a network of connections, what does that make knowledge? It's not something that's in the nodes or in the connections, but it's something that emerges from that set of connections as a whole. This, uh, I think, is a concept that's being more widely recognized um, than it was, say, when we first came out with it. Uh, it's an understanding, well, as uh, Diaz Hernandez, uh, sorry, Diaz and Hernandez de Frutos uh, said, uh, you know, it's a, it's a recognition that uh, knowledge emerges from the network, transcends its members, in a collaborative or I would say cooperative knowledge building process and it's not something that's deterministic it's something that arises spontaneously it's something that happens when you create a network but it's also something they say that should be encouraged uh, which sounds right to me um, how else is connectivism being interpreted uh, it's also being interpreted as part of the learning process as I said here's a presentation um, looking at uh, a model that has five components, including the, the classroom, uh, tools, uh, the role of the teacher, learning resources, and learning assessment. And these are placed in the context of the connectivist learning method, uh, if you will, uh, which is aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. 
this method comes from the idea again of knowledge as being the uh, organization of a network but it's also the idea of being a learner as being a node in that network because we have learning happening not just on the personal level but on the social level and a lot of learning is about that social level and at that social level uh, the way we learn is to be a node in that network and the process is aggregation remixing repurposing feed feeding forward now does this model explain everything well not everybody thought that it, it explains everything in fact a number of people say that it does not uh cabrero and roman who i'll come back to a number of times in this talk say that uh, the principles of connectivism should not be used to explain every kind of learning and knowledge and here's where i disagree with a lot of the commentators uh and and George mentioned this as well in his talk. Uh, we think that the model of knowledge and the model of learning posited by connectivism as the formation of connections across the networks is a general underlying theory that explains not only learning in an individual, but also social learning also network learning, also computational learning. That the same kind of processes are at work here. So a big part of this talk is going to be about um, how well does that hold up? Uh, and, and as we'll see, a number of people certainly disagree with that perspective uh, of connectivism. Finally, how connectivism is being interpreted today by people. Uh, well, certainly the idea of learning as a network formation process. This is an idea that has resonance. It's caught the imagination of people. Uh, I think partially because we made it so clear in the design of the ma massive open online course, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but also the rise of networks generally since we came out with connectivism more than a decade ago. Uh, things like um, networks in the form of online social networks um, and networks in the sense of multiple simultaneous extraneous influences on a belief other than the object of belief. Uh, Jonathan and others say that um, you know, context in the connectivistic view includes elements like emotions, recent experiences, beliefs in the surrounding environment. This is the idea that there isn't this single unitary thing that there's a belief, that rather our knowledge, our concepts, our ideas are things that arise out of a more complex thing, that is the network. This approach leads some to emphasize the network aspect in the organization and of learning generally. Uh, Mediatar, for example, says that, uh, you know, the ideas of connectivism should inspire people to create networks between schools, teachers, and students, and to see the connecting forces in order to be able to perform in this new world of knowledge. So bringing connectivism into our understanding of learning and the learning process. As well, the act of being in the network is also part of the learning process. And uh, so Milassi and I do talk about decision-making itself being part of the learning process. They write, choosing what to learn and the meaning of incoming information is seen through the lens of a shifting reality. While there's a right answer now, it may be the wrong tomorrow due to alterations in the information climate affecting the decision. I think this is exactly right. And this is the understanding of, ne of knowledge from this network centric perspective. The network isn't a single static thing. Uh, it changes, it reorganizes. And with each reorganization, the knowledge changes, the perspective changes. And you might say, I'm sure some people do, I think maybe it's not really knowledge. but. You know, this comes back to how do you define knowledge, right? Uh, from my perspective, 
Knowledge just is the organization of that network. To know something is to not be able to not know it. Or another way of looking at it, knowing something is recognizing something, recognizing that something is the case, say, and recognition is a network process. To recognize something is for your network to, if you will, snap to attention to some kind, uh, to some uh, experience or perception. So, interesting thoughts there. Now, of course, uh, from the day we came out with connectivism and continuing to the present day, there are criticisms of connectivism. Um, Kopp, Rita Kopp, for example, uh, in her own research of our Planck course in 2010, said that not all students are able to autonomously direct their own learning. And that's true, although I'm seeing that this is the case less and less and less, as the students in our courses are more and more network aware over time. So, and, and so I'm not seeing that particular criticism uh, so much in the 2018-2019 literature. Uh, we also have the question, and this is raised by Audado, uh, of how learners form connections. And the question is here, can connectivism explain this? Can connectivism show how this is done? Now Dado talks about uh, a multi-stage process of forming a connection to a node. And you see that in the illustration there, it includes cognitive processing, planning of forethought and evaluation. Um, I think that these are I don't want to say natural physical phenomena, but I think these are natural physical phenomena. Uh, now, that's kind of hand wavy, but I think that the structure that Audado puts on this process is an interpretive structure. Uh, you know, he sees something happening and he calls it cognitive processing. And the argument isn't that there's nothing happening. Yeah, there's something happening. The argument here is that maybe cognitive processing is the wrong kind of thing to call what's happening. Um, other criticisms, uh, again, McNess and Bell back in 2015 uh, pointed out that Many students had mixed feelings and experiences in connectivist courses, some even feeling disconnected, demotivated, demoralized, disenfranchised, and disturbed, which Gonsalves uh, and Osorio describe as the dark side of connectivism. Again, though, I think that this is a question of the adaptivity of the students to uh, a network form of learning. And I think that this is declining over time, although clearly with, uh, you know, it's still showing up in the literature in 2018, um, there are questions as to whether this has gone away completely. And of course, it might never go away completely. You know, people aren't born learning to network. Um, you know, except, you know, maybe on a neural level. They aren't born knowing how to interoperate socially um, and you know if they're moving from an environment where they've always been told what to do to an environment where they ha have to make decisions for themselves well they, they have to be able to ramp up their skills and abilities in doing so but as as gets talked about later uh, they need to be in an environment where that's encouraged and that's not an instructivist environment that's a connectivist environment we'll come back to that um, so uh, Gonsalves and Osorio also say that there are no activities in a MOOC that can be implemented collectively. So there's a tendency for lack of involvement and participation. I don't think that's true. Um, I think maybe that it was true. It's certainly true in X MOOCs. Uh, but, you know, if you look at DS-106, for example, or even the most recent MOOC that I offered, you can have activities that are, I don't want to say implemented collectively, but where people can work together. Uh, finally, in, in a really nice paper, uh, Pando criticizes connectivism 
from the perspective of it threatens, in a way, the human condition uh, with respect to their existential problems, their social ties, their values, uh, doing, due to the so-called, according to Bauman, the generation of liquid modernity. And he asks, has a new question arised? Has connectivism turned out to be a new behaviorism? And yeah, kind of. Uh, connectivism is a kind of behaviorism in the sense that um, there is the stimulus response aspect of it. We're, we're talking about input processing output. But the big difference between connectivism and behaviorism, to my mind, is that in the case of behaviorism, we had a black box, uh, which, say, Ryle would simply call dispositions. In connectivism, we open this black box. And this is really what makes connectivism different from instructivism, different from constructivism. We open the black box and look at what's happening inside. And lo and behold, it's machinery. But what else would it be? And here's the fundamental disagreement with Pando. Um, you know, if in fact the human condition is to be a set of neurons, then how is it that connectivism threatens the human condition? It may threaten a certain perspective of the human condition, but that perspective might be wrong. So, okay. Um, in the next few, little bit of this presentation, I'm going to look at connectivism from two major perspectives. First, connectivism as a pedagogy, or connectivism as pedagogy. And then second, connectivism as a learning theory. Both interesting discussions. Connectivism as pedagogy, or as informing pedagogy, comes up a lot. Um, so right off the bat, we have... Um, some work by Wang, Anderson, and Chen analyzing the Change 11 course. So it's like seven years between course and publication. That shows some of the lag of, of the literature out there on connectivism. Um, but one of the things they observe, they observe a lot of things, but one of the things they observe is that the interaction around topics and topic generation supports the idea of learning as network creation after the analysis of participation patterns that are based on some deep interactive topic. So in other words, learning, you know, at least in a connectivist course, is network creation. And the argument here is that's on an individual level as, as well as on a course level. Uh, and this diagram comes from their paper. You look at the different forms of input and the different forms of output that we have in this uh, course, in the Change 11 MOOC specifically. And now if you look at for each one of those uh, lines, there's a number of people using that mode, whether it's Blogspot, Edublogs, WordPress, Dijo Groups, discussions, whatever, and they're interacting with each other and that's what creates that network. Another way that connectivism is being thought of as informing pedagogy is in the uh, active learning classrooms model. Uh, this is talked about by Profit, uh, but is drawing on uh, uh, Jeber uh, and others from 2015. And in an active learning classroom, it's kind of a mix between instructivism and connectivism. Jeber says, uh, for an ALC to be effective, three parts must be in place. The transmission of knowledge, engagement of students, and ability to develop learning independence. I think the last two are important and are part of connectivism and how connectivism informs this. But transmission of knowledge isn't something that I think happens on the connectivist model. Knowledge, remember, is an organization of neural states. You have one. I have one, other people have one. Now we don't transmit that organization of neural states. We transmit a word, a picture, a sound, uh, tequila, whatever, right? Um, that's what gets transmitted. Uh, we might, on some interpretations, call this a representation of a neural state, although I think that even would be taking it too far. Basically, it's a signal or a message um, or a token. So that's what there must be transmission of, 
right? There needs to be some kind of interaction. But the interaction doesn't consist of bits of knowledge. The interaction consists of bits of signals so it's such that a change in one state of knowledge, one person's neural network, results in a change in another person's neural network. Doesn't mean the two neural networks are going to end up the same. And I think that's an important distinction to draw. Um, even so, the, you know, I mean, you don't have to agree with me on that point to agree with the idea of active learning classrooms and the idea of creating more interaction and uh, cooperation in classrooms. And so we see, for example, from Rice, uh, strategies for implementing connectivism in a traditional K-12 classroom. Uh, you know, and, and she outlines a few things, shifting from teacher-centered to student-centered, readily available devices, uh, not providing information that students can active access themselves, um, using technology networks, using social networks, all of these are ways connectivism can be incorporated into a classroom. Um, another aspect of pedagogical aspect of connectivism is some of the stuff that is spun off or spun out of connectivism. One of those is micro learning. Now, Theo Hug, uh, back in the 2000s, uh, organized some micro learning conferences and some volumes on the subject, uh, which first of all drew on connectivism. Uh, and secondly, were fairly influential in the corporate learning community and micro learning itself is something that's taken off since then. Uh, the Gagne and others um, in 2018 talk about that uh, and they talk about how the basis of micro learning is connectivism. Uh, because of the ability to form connections between ideas, uh, the way they facilitate our ability to form connections with each other and with sources of information. And I think that's a reasonable interpretation. Um, Microlearning isn't the whole of connectivism, obviously, but, and, and connectivism isn't the whole of microlearning, but I think we can certainly see the influence of the one idea there. Similarly with open learning and open educational resources, um, which is also discussed in the literature of 2018. Um, you know, the, the, and this is the idea, again, that I talked about earlier that, you know, it's not knowledge going from one person to the next. It's objects and resources and things and sometimes uh, tequila. Uh, and uh, Zeruski, Lopez, and Schlunzen say that uh, in open educational resources, the contents organized and structured at the beginning of the course serve more to initiate discussions and foster curiosity rather than be considered absolute truths. And I think this is an important aspect of connectivism that, you know, we think of knowledge as being these artifacts, but these artifacts aren't knowledge. Uh, even the things that we say in language are absolute truths, are in fact artifacts. They're things that we create. The knowledge is the mental state that we are in. Uh, this absolute truth, whether it's, you know, one plus one equals two, written out in symbols on a chalkboard, that is a thing. It is an object. It is a creation and not itself knowledge a very important aspect of connectivism. Um, connectivism is pedagogy continuing. Uh, the, the whole network thing um, becomes a pedagogical principle. We have Pao and Ma talking about teaching design strategy for innovation and entrepreneurship and talking about how group members should comply with the principle of voluntariness and how they should take on equal roles in a group and each group member performs their own duties. This is the idea of uh, voluntary participation, very important, and as well the idea of distribution of responsibility. We don't have 
a single source of truth informing the other members of the group. Rather, uh, it becomes a negotiation, if you will, between equals. Uh, which, you know, and at that point, it's not what I would call a group properly so called. Uh, it takes on the properties of a network. Uh, and so what we have in these groups is not collaboration necessarily, but more something like cooperation where uh, each person contributes to the group, each person gets value from the group, but what they contribute and the value that they get isn't necessarily the same for each person contributing and getting value from the group. Um, now there's also uh, the idea that uh, because learning is network, because learning is technology supported network, that it also fosters global learning. And this, some of the principles of connectivism become especially important at this point, not just autonomy, uh, but also diversity uh, and openness. And uh, there's a, a paper uh, from Mahmoud Ali and Shah talking about how the MOOC emerged because of the learning theories related to learners, whether individuals or networks of learners. Uh, the MOOC is an outcome of connectivism, but the MOOC, the, the idea of the MOOC, and here I'm not thinking specifically of, you know, the, the X MOOC, the Stanford MOOC, the, the, the Harvard or MIT MOOC, but more the MOOC that is a network of people interested in the same subject. This idea has spread around the world, and part of what I've noticed in studying connectivism in 2019 is that it has become a global phenomenon, that I'm reading uh, stuff from people from China, from people from Iran, people from Nepal, people from uh, South America, people from South Africa, um, and even Canada. Uh, and this spread of uh, the idea of connectivism around the world is an instantiation of the idea of connectivism. Um, but also there's the idea of global learning generally, global learning as an extension of connectivism, uh, as bringing together uh, you know, multiple, pers multiple perspectives, multiple points of views, on uh, problems like, uh, well, Madhuk, Frank, and Heller talk about uh, public health human resource shortages. How can we bring the global community to bear on something like that? Um, you know, and it's a bit of an aside, but a lot of the dialogue that's taking place in conflict zones, uh, looking for truth and reconciliation, uh, whether in South Africa, whether in Canada, whether in Colombia, a lot of this has to do with the idea that there are diverse perspectives, there are diverse experiences, every experience is valid. There isn't an authoritative, uh, you know, version of the event that devalues another person's perspective of it. And reconciliation means seeing that, allowing these diverse perspectives, allowing each person to have their own voice, uh, as, as we say sometimes in Canada, to speak their own truth. Um, and that's how we get to global learning as an extension of connectivism. And indeed, that's how we get to a lot of these global networks of value generally. Now I want to look at connectivism as a, a theory of learning. And it's worth noting that as soon as we were out of the gate with it, people said connectivism should not be considered a new theory of learning. We have uh, Kerr saying this in 2007, Cop in the Hill, Cop, uh, that'd be Rita Cop, Francis Bell, Clara and Barbera, uh, Anderson and Drone, etc. And all of these are cited by Homanova in 2018. So there's aspects of that argument that still hasn't gone away. Uh, but I, I'm finding that that argument is kind of drifting off and it isn't as important uh, as much as other people think it is, uh, but it still lingers. 
Pomanova says, uh, citing Tracy in 2009, uh, that really connectivism should be perceived as an extension of existing theories. Um, again, and I mentioned before, Cabrero and Ramon say, connectivism is only the evolution of previous schools and not a theoretical revolution in pedagogy. We're going to come back to that, but I want to flag that for the discussion of connectivism as a theory of learning. Um, also, there are the criticisms of connectivism as a theory of learning from the perspective of it just doesn't explain the kind of things you would expect a theory of learning to explain. Um, so, and there are a number of uh, points put forward by Clara and Barbara uh, a number of years ago. I did respond to them in an article myself, but I think it's worth flagging them again here because they're still being cited in the literature here. Um, so one thing uh, they say is that connectivism is unable to explain concept development. If a concept consists of a specific pattern of associations, how can it be explained that the concept develops but the associations remain the same? Of course, that's not exactly how it happens. But uh, as well, uh, you know, they say you know, connectivism does not explain how the information provided in the nodes is integrated into the existing knowledge and structure. Ex sorry, existing knowledge structure of the network after the learning is built. Um, and I, from my perspective, I think that there, well, I think it's very clear that they're arguing from the perspective of uh, Plato, the perspective of Chomsky, this is sometimes called Chomsky's problem. Um, there are some things, cognitive things that we do that can't be explained by an associationist or a connectivist perspective. Therefore, associationism or connectivism is wrong. But my response to these things in general is to say that these things that Plato and Chomsky and now Clara and Barbara say that we have or can do aren't things that we have or can do. Um, you know, we'll, we'll go to Plato and Chomsky. They say that we can grasp universal truths. Uh, you know, like the ideal triangle or, you know, the unchanging syntax of a grammar. And pure experience or reliance on experience only doesn't allow us to grasp these universal truths. Therefore, there's, you know, the reliance on experience doesn't tell us the whole story. But I think that we don't actually grasp universal truths. We can create artifacts, sentences, uh, pieces of writing that reference universal truths, but it does not follow that we have, in fact, grasped them. And I think that's what's happening here with the objections posed by Clara and Barbara. I think that they say, you know, we we have these concepts that are distinct from patterns of, self, of association. So how can the patterns of association explain the concept? And, you know, how can one change and the other not change? But that's not what happens. There is no concept over and above the pattern of associations. The pattern of associations is the concept. And so there isn't any sense to be made of the concept developing and the pattern of associations remaining the same. That thing that they say happens doesn't happen. So, uh, I want to return now to the argument, um, and again, this is uh, stated largely by Cabrero and Roman, uh, and the argument is that um, connectivism isn't new, because basically it's an extrapolation on previous theories. And they cite a bunch of things in their paper. They talk about the principles of Gestalt. In fact, they even go back to Freud, which is a bit surprising, but nonetheless. They talk about discoveries in cognitive neuroscience related to mirror neurons. They talk about um, the way the open network course was based on connectivism from a neurocognitive perspective. Uh, they talk about how 
uh, connectivism agrees with constructivism um, in uh, the focus on the learner, how the learner has a main role in the learning process. Connectivism, similarly to chaos theory, they say, does not consider that learning is guided, creates a cognitive order, and is intentional. Um, and they, they cite Levin, 2002, uh, on the uh, characteristics of complex adaptive systems, the diversity and individuality of its components. Uh, that's uh, prior, of course, to connectivism. They talked about conversation theory, originally suggested by Pask, elaborated by Lorillard, uh, and they talked about actor network theory, and this came up a lot, in fact, in the earlier days uh, of connectivism. Um, and, and the whole idea of the actant rhizome ontology, which is a sociological approach born in the 1980s, uh, and then developed by people like Latour and Law in the 1990s. And even network learning or aim learning uh, of Pulsani 2003, which was inspired by Linda Harassan and, and her book, of course, Learning Networks. So, yeah, connectivism had, you know, and I, I would go further in my talk this morning. Um, you know, I, I mentioned graph theory, connectivism. Uh, draws on and has a lot to do with graph theory. Uh, Al, uh, Duncan J. Watts, Alfred Laszlo Barabasi, uh, drawing even more on um, neural networks, artificial intelligence, connectionist systems. Um, I would even go so far as to say connectivism draws on the philosophy of David Hume uh, and associationism um, and, and therefore classical British empiricism. None of these things, though, implies that connectivism is those things, right? The similarity between gestalt and connectivism does not mean connectivism is gestalt. That would be an absurd statement to make. Uh, similarly, you know, I mean, uh, the theory of mirror, neuro, mirror neurons uh, with aspects of connectivism doesn't mean the two things are the same and that connectivism is just an extension of mirror neurons. And in fact, this whole list of things that's presented here by Cabrero and Roman should be thought of as evidence to make a different statement. And that different statement is there's something about connectivism that underlies all of them. And that that's what connectivism is trying to get at. Now, Maybe George and I got at what that is, or maybe we didn't. We could argue about that. And you, you look at all the developments in machine learning recently, um, in that, and in that other paper that I mentioned, tracing the development of machine learning, you see, you know, from simple perceptrons to deep learning networks to convolutional neural networks, etc. There's a lot of ways. Uh, organizations of networks can come together to create knowledge. We're also saying a lot of these networks do a lot of the things that people were saying that networks can't do. Uh, do things like um, recognize people even if we don't know what people are. Do things like uh, write news articles that are fake. Uh, you know, you, you watch these things in, in the news and you begin to say, oh, maybe these networks can do these things. And so what we have, you know, in Gestalt, mirror neurons, uh, you know, the importance of the learner chaos theory, we have something like an explanation that underlies all of these. And this explanation is based in a theory of interactivity between simple components which we call networks, and that these networks can perform what we have previously called cognitive tasks. For example, via recognition to be able to create and maintain and, pr and promote and use knowledge. That's, you know, that's the idea of connectivism. Now, are we exactly right on every point? Probably not. Is there something to it that's new that causes us to maybe rethink how we've been thinking about all of these things? 
I think there is. And so that's the argument for connectivism as a theory, probably. Although, as both George and I say, it doesn't really matter whether you think it's a theory or not, because it isn't about whether it's a theory. It's about, is it the correct description? Is it a good explanation for the phenomena? Can we use this productively uh, in education and in our wider lives? And that's where we look at now, where we look next. Does connectivism work? Whether or not it's a theory, who cares? Whether or not it's a pedagogy, who cares? Does it work? Uh, and the answer is yes. Now, okay, maybe too quick, right? Um, there are encouraging results from the literature, including some that I found from 2018, keeping in mind that, you know, it's the book is never closed on this, that some of the successes attributed to connectivism might be attributed to other things. Um, there may be counterexamples, etc. And of course, it all depends on what you count as success, and I'll talk about that in a bit. So, but uh, the evidence for success, uh, there's one set of results having to do with motivation. Uh, Borna and Folda Chang talk about how connectivism in educational and learning processes lead to increased motivational beliefs. Um, Kotawa, uh, Kotawa Nietzsche and others talk about how experts agreed that using cloud-based tools and connectivist learning method would be appropriate and would produce uh, fruitful results. Um, the same authors talk about positive motivational outcomes such as academic self-efficacy and task value with learner. And this goes back to some of the early criticisms of connectivism and of MOOCs where we were told that you know people aren't able to navigate for themselves they aren't able to make their own learning decisions etc and you know it's interesting we look at the difference from 2008 to 2019 uh 2008 we had a much less network literate population than we do in 2019 and in 2019 we're beginning to see how network courses promote you know self-efficacy rather than are hindered because students lack this you know again it's one of these chicken and egg things right you're not going to get good at this unless you do this and if you haven't been doing this you're probably not going to be good at it so that's one thing um, and it speaks to ability to learn um, you know uh, there's one interesting paper and in, uh, the diagram is there on the slide from Fianu and others uh, looking at uh, what motivates people to use MOOCs and uh, of the uh, seven hypotheses considered two of them effort expectancy and social influence were found not to be valid, but the others were, right? Self-efficacy, system quality, uh, performance expe expectancy, etc. So it's not because it's social that MOOCs are used, that connectivism works. Rather, uh, and this is Sarnock and Juana Pirun talking, students in higher education learning Sorry, students in higher education learning environments will prepare for the future when they become self-directed learners and more and more motivated by learning than performance. Learners must control their own self-study method and apply various learning methods to autonomous learning. And this is the thing. Connectivism makes people better learners because they need to be better learners in order to succeed at connectivism. It's not a magic thing. It needs practice, it needs interaction, it needs good role models, but this is what happens. And when they do become better learners, then they become less reliant on instructivism. And they become, in fact, uh, better judges of what's true and false, less likely to make errors. Uh, Cao, uh, CAO, uh, talked about how connectivism can effectively reduce the error rate of students um, by looking at uh, you know what uh, was called connotation of relevance theory 
All right, so just looking at the various factors that might impact on an outcome or on the truth of a statement, looking at it not just as a thing in itself, but as a thing in a context with many relevant factors surrounding it, that can reduce the error rate of students. And when you look at it that way, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Um, as well, the elements of connectivism, we talked about what makes uh, for a viable network. Well, what makes a viable network is, in, in my own opinion, autonomy, diversity, interactivity, and openness. So I consider these core principles of connectivism. Are they worth anything? Well, we have uh, Mohammed uh, Ubedullah and Yusuf saying that um, they have a positive significant effect on students' achievement. And Sarnak and uh, Awana Perun talk about learning process and the learning outcome will relate to experience and building up the new experience. Uh, so again, you know, the fact that one paper says, you know, this makes the performance improve uh, doesn't mean a whole lot. Even, you know, I've got maybe uh, a half a dozen or more here. Still doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, a lot of it means, uh, you know, what was it you were trying to do in the first place? And that's why I would argue that we need to move forward and look more widely. Moving forward, um, there, there's a few things. Um, there's the role of critical thinking. Um, if we look at the world from a connectivist perspective, we also do critical thinking differently. We're less likely to rely on authorities. We're more likely to look for diverse sources, different types of evidence, and that's going to help us become better critical thinkers. And so, uh, you know, critical thinking as a means of achieving deep learning, critical thinking ability and other higher order thinking abilities is, as Hongland says, a goal of deep learning and deep learning research in general. Uh, I would say it's also a goal of global learning and, and learning in general. Um, there's also the concept of rhizomatic learning, which I would consider an, an outgrowth of connectivism. Of course, Dave Cornier has, and others have been involved in that. I got a paper from Zadusky, Lopez, and Schlunzen uh, talking about how, uh, you know, connectivism and rhizomatic learning environments are themes that are articulated and strengthened due to cyber culture. These work naturally in a network environment and we sh can be and we should be looking at the different kinds of network environments we can develop. Just as in machine learning they're looking at different kinds of neural networks, we should be looking at different kinds of social organization and social networks. And that's why, to my mind, things like diaspora are interesting Things like civic are interesting, uh, and even things like blockchain and hyperledger are interesting. And these are things that I've talked about, of course, in other talks. Um, but also, when we look at social networks, we find that giving students a sense of control seems to be vital in successful social network use. Uh, Palace, Eidenfalk, and Engel said that in their paper. Uh, you know, you give students control over the content, the direction of the debate, and how and when they are engaged in online negotiation. You give them that, that leads to better outcomes. Finally, uh, and I thought this was an interesting thing. I, I found a paper by Tabaki and others uh, talking about the concept of cognitive cities um, as a counterpoint to the recent discussion of smart cities. Smart cities are top down. Smart cities are created by companies like Google and imposed on, say, the Toronto Harbor Front. But a cognitive city is a different kind of city. It's one where the uh, organization is from the ground up where the smartness of the city comes from the interaction between the members and things like uh, their cars and their websites, etc. I thought that was an interesting concept. And it really does point to you know, the, the, the way a deeper understanding of these phenomena can be important. And that leads to the idea of thinking of connectivism more widely.
you know, we talk about connectivism, is it successful? Uh, you know, does it make people comfortable in class? Does it lead to better learning outcomes as, as what, higher test scores maybe? I think we should look at connectivism much more widely than that. Um, what makes connectivism successful isn't better test grades. Um, in fact, I think to better test grades are, are pretty irrelevant. Uh, what would make, what would be a test of the success of connectivism? Well, better and, you know, building relationships, building better understanding relationships, sorry, building better, try that again, building relationships, building better relationships, building a better understanding of society as diverse and in constant change where knowledge is continually growing. That's something we need today. That's what we should be measuring for, right? Um, as well, the understanding of distributed cognition. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, knowledge isn't a single static central thing, that our best teaching and learning practices have to be, as, as George mentioned, in fact, in, in the morning session, more along the lines of psychology, more along the lines of medicine, where we say, you know, there isn't one single solution for everybody. There isn't one medicine that everybody should take. There isn't one psychology that everyone should practice. Um, there isn't one diet that works for every single person. Uh, each person is an individual. Um, and so each health psychology and education program needs to, I don't want to say be personalized because, you know, you can't take something off the shelf and personalize it, but it needs to be focused on that person and based on that person. Uh, and that means the person has to have agency. That means that, at least in the educational context, there needs to be an authentic audience, an authentic learning situation, and there needs to be room for voice opportunity and creativity. And something that Tucker, Wyckoff, and Green say in their paper. Uh, a combination, here's Hazel Dean, Yardley, and Sherman, a combination of flexibility in learning with supported learning autonomy leads to the development of learners' understanding and confidence. That's an outcome that we want, right? The development of learners' understanding and confidence. We don't have tests that measure understanding and confidence. We have tests that measure whether they remember facts, but it would be more relevant to measure for understanding and confidence. Uh, Ankel and uh, Swaminthan talk about uh, a robust, heterogeneous personal learning network that allows me to collaborate with people around the world. Global collaboration is a good thing. And an evaluation of an outcome of connectivism is, are we able to foster that? Are we able to foster relationships and linkages, hearkening back to that first point again, not just with people in our own community, but with people around the world, with people who are different from us? That's a challenging thing to do, yet it's not something that we evaluate when we evaluate our uh, education system. Uh, and it also allows us to think about learning and knowledge, not just as, you know, these static abstract goods, but as the things that lead to uh, growth, development, and creativity, something I've put in the slide as co-creation. Um, you know, Glassman and Kang, for example, talk about how online communities have become a driving force in knowledge production. Uh, and they, they offer the open source educative processes framework worth having a look at, right? Um, or Diaz and DeFrutos talk about virtual communities of building knowledge, VCBK. Um, they talk about how New Linux is a program developed by a VCBK as well as Wikipedia. Now, I'm sure a lot of people are hearkening back to Etienne Wenger's uh, communities of practice. And there's a lot of overlap between communities of, pra of practice and connectivism. As I said earlier, that doesn't mean they're the same theory, right? But it does mean that 
we have a way of explaining, understanding, contextualizing why communities of practice are so important. Because they create these linkages, because they create knowledge networks in a society. Um, and finally, our understanding of a VCBK also helps us understand what learning is. Um, again, uh, Diaz and DeFrutos. Learning and knowledge are not transferred from one network member to another, but rather are the product of the creative acts of all members' interactions. And that's the key moment when a course becomes a VCBK. That's the key moment when we move from the old instructivist paradigm to a connectivist paradigm. So, that's the talk that I gave this morning. This is a longer version of the talk, but it's basically the talk. Um, so uh, I hope this uh, video serves as a poor substitute for the real thing. Um, and now I'm gonna get back to the conference because I'm probably missing a little bit of it. But thank you for taking the time to listen to my talk today. I'm Stephen Downs, and it's a pleasure to be with you, as always. And uh, if you have any comments or suggestions, all of this stuff is online. Check out my newsletter um, and uh, you know, tweet me, comment to me, email me, whatever. Uh, don't Facebook me, though. I don't use Facebook. Thanks a lot, and so long for now.